Good day um, and welcome uh, to this message, time for a message. Actually, thank you for inviting me into your homes and places for this opportunity to share from God, God's Word. Here in uh, Alberta, we're in the middle of August, coming summer seems to be almost in a way flying by. Um, the last uh, number of weeks, uh, we've had uh, really the blessing of having Pastor David uh, do our summer series right from the beginning up until now, and now I'm back from some holidays, and it was just a nice break, and, uh, and good to visit some family I haven't seen in a couple years. As many people are doing that as well this year. So um, just want to continue along in our summer series. Uh, we don't have really a title for it, but it's basically a journey in biblical poetry. And I just want to say this about poetry, biblical poetry. It's not like probably the way we understand poetry today. And really in a nutshell, it's the way the, uh, the, the psalmist and the authors of these psalms uh, that we're going to be looking at today just put it down on paper, if you will. And last week, Pastor Davis, David brought us a message from Proverbs. Today, we're returning to the book of Psalms, uh, specifically to Psalm number 2, Psalm 2. But before we actually turn to that psalm and read it together, uh, we would be to our prophet to situate it in the context of the book, well, Physically, it's located right at the beginning. And I would suggest to you that Psalm 1 and 2 really do belong together. They're a companion, and they set the movement, the direction of the rest of the book, at least in some ways. We also, when we look at Psalm 1 and 2 together, uh, it presents to us an idealistic view uh, for us, the reader. And it goes something like this. So Psalm 1, we have this... Uh, perspective or this insight into a righteous person, a godly person, someone who delights in God and his word, the law. Uh, they live by the divine instructions given by God. This person delights, it says in Psalm 1, the word delights is there in the word of God, and they meditate on the law day and night. This makes one a wise person, a wise follower of God. And here in Psalm 2, which we'll be looking at today, what we have here is God's chosen king and God's chosen nation. This would, of course, be Israel and the house of David. And what we have here is a righteous king and a righteous nation under God. And why are they righteous? Well, in the same way as the godly uh, person of Psalm 1 is righteous, the king and the nation here, obviously Israel, uh, lives up to the divine instructions given to the king and to the nation of Israel. For God, uh, for Israel and the king, delight in the word of God and the law. So we have this godly person of Psalm 1, the chosen king, the nation of Israel, and because of their obedience to God and his word and desire to follow him, uh, they're not really impacted as uh, this phrase we find in Psalm 1, the way of sinners. And we look at the rest of the book, Psalm 3, right to the end, 150 uh, uh, psalms. Um, really, there's a sense of failure in contrast to Psalm 1 and 2. Failure of God's chosen nation, uh, God, a failure of God's chosen king, King David and his dynasty. Very, very interesting to note that the very best of godly Israelites failed to live up to the promises or to the promises or the, the, the word of God that we see in Psalm 1 and 2. And I just want to really set it straight that this is not a failure on God's part. It's not a failure of people. Well, looking at Psalm 2 specifically, uh, as I mentioned, it is a poetic psalm. Um, it, it, it does have this sense of organization and it's called it really it's called a chiasm and I don't I don't want to get into it too much here I would encourage you to do your own work with Hebrew poetry it's it, it's very interesting at least from my perspective and it is quite helpful and, and you wouldn't be disappointed but anyways let's get right to Psalm 2 let's read it together and uh, and see where we go from there Psalm 2 verse 1 why do the nations rage <laughs> 
and the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Verse 4, He who sits in in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Verse 7, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As for me, I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Verse 10, Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, or in other words, honor the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The Lord bless the reading of, the, of his word. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you for your word. As we look here at Psalm 2, we are reminded of your, your, your sovereignty, that you reign. And Lord, as we commit our time to you, I, we pray by your spirit that you'd help us understand, not only stand, but put into, uh, uh, into our lives deeply and into our actions as well. We praise you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Scott Hubbard, editor of DesiringGod.org, in one of his articles entitled, A Son Worthy to Be King, reflects on the genealogy of Jesus Christ that we find in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. And upon that reflection, Hubbard said this about Jesus Christ. Quote, We always needed a son of David greater than David, one who was anointed not with oil, but with the Holy Spirit, one who would slay not Goliath, but death, one who would win his bride, not by shedding another man's blood, but by spilling his own, one whose end wasn't the grave, but the throne, and such a king we have in Christ, end quote. See, here's here's what I want to share with you. Here's what I want to suggest to you, that Psalm 2 is at its very core messianic and prophetic at the same time. Old Testament prophecy, while speaking obviously in its own time, when you you understand how it operates, when it speaks to its own time and context, also points forward to a time yet to come. And Psalm 2, I would suggest that we encounter a messianic prophecy. A prophecy that begins its fulfillment with the first coming of Jesus Christ. And if we look at the Old Testament, it is consistently from beginning and pointing to the one whom God would send to redeem his people. If we were to read Psalm 2 along with books such as uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, the Gospels, and Revelation, it would be understandable to see Psalm 2 as messianic and prophetic. Because here in Psalm 2, It is pointing to a Messiah, not as a babe in the manger, but a king who will one day rule over all. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in his letter to the Philippians, that one day, um, Paul said, one day every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In keeping with the poetic nature of uh, Psalm 2, the chiasm, we begin with verse 1 and 3 and treat it as a whole. And the psalmist here begins with a rhetorical question. Let's read that together, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Friends, verse 1 to 3 presents a world in turmoil. Nations conspiring and plotting and scheming. The leaders, the kings of these nations coming together for one cause. Coming together, as verse 2 reminds us, against the Lord and his anointed. In a way, I don't think it's too hard to see here, uh, through the lens of Psalm 2, the current turmoil in our world as well. But more importantly, that nations and leaders today are coming together against the Lord and his anointed. I would also ask you to notice one particular word the psalmist included with all this conspiring, conspiring pardon me, and scheming against God. 
And he places it at the very end of verse 1, and it's the word, ver, the word vain. All this plotting and conspiring is in vain. Nothing but fruitless effort when said and done. This brings us to the next set of verses, verse 4 to 6. And what we have here is the response to the kings and nations from heaven itself. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, those that are conspiring against him. The NIV puts it this way, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Very interesting perspective, isn't it? There's this old Yiddish saying that you may have heard, uh, maybe in a different way, and it goes something like this, man plans and God laughs. We turn to the wisdom of Proverbs for this. We look at Proverbs 19, verse 21, and there we read, many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is a purpose of the Lord that will stand. However, there is more here in Psalm 2 to the Lord's response to the schemers and the plotters than not acknowledging God's God in their plans. If we remember what Psalm 1 would say about the, uh, the, unbel- the wicked, the schemers, the plotters, Psalm 1 reminds us that they will not stand in judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Verse 5 reveals how God deals, will deal in the final analysis with schemers and plotters. Verse 5, then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. See, God reminds these wicked schemers, these, uh, these conspiring against him and his anointed one, who actually reigns, for the Lord reigns. And he sets his purposes into human history. As we see here in verse 6, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God sets his purposes. He does not depend on anyone to make that decision for him. But there's some questions here with verse 6. We need to dent- the 5 and 6. Well, 6 specifically, we have to try and figure out what is Zion and who's the king that the psalmist is uh, referring to here. Well, Zion, we'll deal with that first, is simply another name for Jerusalem. Sometimes you've heard the saying, the city of David. That's where God established his temple and uh, his very presence in the midst of his people, Israel. Next question, who is God's king? Well, keeping in mind that we're dealing with what I am calling a messianic prophecy, we get a clue from verse 2, and the word anointed, which in the original is the Hebrew word, mosh, I have to say this properly, moshia, moshia. I'm not sure if that's correct, or Messiah. In the New Testament, we have the Greek Uh, uh, interpretation of this Old Testament Hebrew, Christ. Friends, it's God who reigns over history and who has set his Messiah, his Christ, on Jerusalem, his holy mountain. And all the planning and the plotting of the nations in the days of Israel, all the planning and the plotting of the nations in our days is in vain. Because, friend, the, friends, the Lord reigns and has set his king on the throne, and one day he will come and rule all things. We get a glimpse of this coming, what that will kind of look like, keeping in mind this is a picture with the Apostle John in his, book, in his letter of Revelation. And John writes, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse... The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I just want to press pause for a moment before we look at any more of Psalm 2. And I want to ask this question. A really vital and important question. Are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Are you ready? I mean, are you ready to meet what the Bible calls the faithful and true king? 
You know, the one who will come to make war against the schemers and the plotters who have set themselves up against the anointed one of God. The one who is righteous to judge and the only righteous one to judge. Are you ready to meet this Jesus? Do you have a biblical understanding of Jesus Christ or, or a Christian cultural understanding or some other kind of understanding? You know, it's interesting in these days and in, in the times that we live, all that all the, I even have said now or I've, or I've presented to you now, some might think, Pastor, why are you so critical? Why are you so negative, so judgmental, so legalistic? So like the Pharisees that Jesus faced uh, so often. And, and I thought about that, and I have to reply by saying, am I? Am I really? What should I do? What biblical text should I skip or throw out to not deal with this? Is not all the Bible inspired by God's Holy Spirit? Well, friends, the only thing I know to do to be ready for my Lord and Savior is, is by preaching the whole truth and nothing but the truth. To ask myself daily, am I ready for his coming? Well, now we've arrived at verse 7 to 9. We'll look at that as a package. And we encounter what's called the Lord's decree. We have this phrase, I will tell of the decree, or in the NIV, I will, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. So what did God decree? What did God proclaim? Well, let's, let's do this together. Verse 7 to 9. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Well, in order to really maybe grasp this, these verses in a good way, in an understanding way, is we need to really consider God's covenant with King David. I don't want to get into too much detail there. I hope you understand some of it, and if you don't, you can always read about it in 2 Samuel. God's anointed king as his cho anointed uh, King David as his chosen son, and the king of Israel, and established him in Zion, that is Jerusalem. And then God, through his prophet Nathan, said to King David these things. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. I will give you rest from all your enemies. When your days are fulfilled, I will raise up your offspring after you and I will establish his kingdom. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Find that in seventh, the seventh chapter of 2 Samuel. So what we have here is God's promise of a land for his people Israel. The promise that God would raise up King David's offspring, and he did with Samuel and uh, uh, Solomon, pardon me, and moving on, and establish his kingdom. And that this kingdom, this covenant that God made with David, shall be made for sure forever before me. And your house and your kingdom will be established forever. So now we move forward to the first century. And as I referred to earlier, uh, Matthew's genealogy in the beginning of his gospel. And we read in the very first verse, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Go back to Psalm 2 in verse 7. And let me ask you uh, to pay attention to that, that verse where you read, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And I wonder, have you seen this somewhere else? Somewhere else, or heard this somewhere else? How about the baptism of Jesus? You find that again uh, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. When Jesus was baptized, Matthew writes, or says, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and coming up to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. How about the transfiguration? Same gospel, 17th chapter. He was transfigured, that is, Jesus was transfigured before them, and his faith shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. So here we have Peter and James and John and Moses and Elijah and Jesus all together on the mount, and then we have God the Father show up 
and we, and we hear it this way, or we understand it this way, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So as we consider God's covenant with David and Matthew's commentary here, we want to summarize this, and the, the pulpit commentary really helps us very nicely. Friends, God decreed, God declared that his anointed one is his very own son. And that the Son is to reign over the whole world as his inheritance. The church is the inheritance given to Jesus. And one day he will rule over the whole world. And friends, this will be a complete conquest. This is not a democracy. This is not a communism. This is not anything political. This is the King, Jesus Christ. And all those who conspire against the Son will either bend the knee, or as the text tells us here in Psalm 2, be broken into pieces. Verse 9, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Well, folks, we want to take one more pause and I want to give you another question or ask you another question. The first one was vital and important. Are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? This second one is for a believer, for anyone actually, but certainly for believers, very, very important. How do you see Jesus? How do you interact with him? How do you engage with him? How do you, what do you know about him? Because think about what we read here in, in, in Psalm 2. Have you ever envisioned Jesus as breaking people with a rod of iron, dashing them to pieces like a potter's vessel? We know that this is metaphorical language. So what does this metaphor describe? Does it not describe the day of the Lord, as the Bible calls it, or the day of judgment when Jesus comes? When you think of Jesus' return, how do you think he will come? How do you think he will come? You see, there is today a serious issue, a serious problem, actually, in the evangelical church. Uh, I want to paraphrase Pastor Vody Bauckham's summary of the problem that I will share with you now. Quote, the church has sissified Jesus Christ. The church has sissified Jesus Christ. Now, if this is true, how did this happen? Well, let me begin by introducing you, let me introduce you to Pastor Paul Carter. Now, Pastor Paul Carter uh, began his ministry pastoring in the mid-90s, the same time I beca uh, became a, a believer, or sorry, walking out my faith he became a pastor smack dab in the middle of the seeker-sensitive movement. I'm not sure if you know what that means or ever heard of that. Now, 25 years plus, Pastor Paul spent some time thinking about that season of his life, looking back, and came up with seven reasons the seeker-sensitive movement was destined to fail. Now, of course, we don't have the time to go in depth here, but the one point that he brings up is worth mentioning. The seeker sense of the movement was destined to fail because it wasn't biblical. It wasn't biblical. Central, Pastor Paul said, to the seeker sensitive philosophy is that the unchurched people need a different kind of ministry than church people. So that's uh, interesting to note exactly what happened. Pastors and churches need to put to the side the harder biblical teachings, such as the wrath of God, sin, the coming judgment, the day of the Lord. What is needed is, as Pastor Paul put it, quote, is pithy sermonettes on topics of immediate concern. And then he goes on to say, enter the Sunday morning variety show. And indeed, in so many so many uh, places uh, that call themselves places of worship in the evangelical world, it does look like a variety show, not a time of worship. So what conclusion did Pastor, Pastor Paul come to? Well, the Bible teaches, he said, something altogether different from the seeker-sensitive philosophy. And we see one of those things, that what it actually teaches, in Romans chapter 10, Paul's letters to the Romans chapter 10, verse 17, where Paul, uh, Paul says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Friends, the Bible teaches that, that people are converted by hearing the Bible read and preached. <coughs> Pardon me. 
The saving work of Jesus Christ is to be preached. And sin and hell and grace and faith and salvation, the cross, the resurrection, all those things, all those biblical things, not some talk about money and relationships, not funny stories or dramas or variety shows. Unchurched people get saved by hearing about the biblical Jesus Christ. Not the, as Pastor Vody would say, the sissified Jesus of today's evangelical church. Well, I want to wrap this up now, and that brings us to chapter, uh, verse 10 to 12. And as I was preparing for this message, uh, when I got to here, when I really pondered this, the first thing that struck to me here is the mercy of God, the very wonderful, gracious mercy of God. The conspiring and the scheming ones, the ones that have set themselves up against his anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ, he says to them, Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Before he returns, he's given him a time to repent. He said, be wise, fear the Lord and honor his son. For the righteous followers of God serve the Lord with fear. And this is not cowering fear, this is reverence. And rejoice with trembling. What's the trembling part? Well, you rejoice in, your, in that God has saved you and that God has called you his son or daughter. But the trembling part is remembering that he does have sovereignty over everything and including the judgment of the world to come. For the merciful Lord reigns and will bring all schemers to perfect justice. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 brings a sure promise, if you really, really look at it, of God to those who are wise to serve him and follow him. Verse 12, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Well, folks, I want to go back really quick here in summary. And I want to ask you these two questions. Are you ready for Jesus' return? Are you ready? If you're not, get ready. And two, how do you see Jesus? Until he returns, how do you engage Jesus? Do you do it biblically or do you do it culturally? Christian culture or otherwise? Do you know the biblical Jesus? Do you follow the biblical Jesus? Have you surrendered your life and everything to the biblical Jesus? Not the Jesus of the Christian culture. Not the Jesus of the world, but the Jesus of the Bible. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that he came that one Christmas, and that he died on the cross, and he rose again for the sin of the world, and for all those who believe and put their trust on, on that, will receive not only eternal life, but the Holy Spirit and belong to the family of God. And God will call them son or daughter. We thank you so much for that. And Lord, we praise you for this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, thank you for being, being with me, or let me be with you. God bless you. Shalom.